Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to the second series of Call My Supervisor, the PhD podcast for the School of Politics and Economics at King's College London. We are delighted to say that after a hugely enjoyable first series last year, the school has let us do it all over again. And once again this year, we'll be speaking to doctoral candidates from one of our departments to pick their brains about all things PhD, from their research and ideas to their revelations and advice. So for those of you who are new, my name is Daniel Mansfield, and I am the Communications Officer for the School of Politics and Economics here at King's. And I'm pleased to introduce you to my co-host for this episode, Clara Goylav, an undergraduate studying with the Department of Political Economy. Hi, Clara. Hello. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest for this episode, John Newton, a doctoral candidate studying with the Department of European and International Studies. Welcome, John. Hey, how's it going? Uh, great. So uh, let's make a start. Over to you, Clara. John, if you could just start us off by introducing your research, maybe giving us, you know, this working title that you may have and just any brief overview that you can provide us with. Yeah, sure. So basically, um, my research looks to study the sort of exchange of ideas between uh, movements of, and the socialist left in the United States and the United Kingdom and the way that Twitter and sort of the emergence of international online political fandoms impacts this sort of exchange of ideas um in terms of in terms of working titles to be honest that, that's not something that's uh i've been so busy sort of doing the research that i, I suppose i haven't really thought much of a working title yet um but yeah that's basically how i would describe the research uh, at large i'll definitely come up with more, something more snappy uh by the time it comes to sort of uh submitting the research but that sort of uh so any suggestions for working titles, uh, always appreciated. But that's um, that's what I'm studying. Uh, again, most of my work is focusing on on Twitter and sort of uh, this emerging online fandom uh, between the socialist left, in particular, the sort of democratic socialist of America and momentum here in the UK. Uh, so yeah, that, that's what I'm researching. And uh, the formal title will be uh, close at a later date. <laughs> John, perhaps we can have a little bit more detail then. You, you say you're looking at the fandoms. What specifically will you be looking at? What, you, what are you going to be looking for? What are you measuring and studying? Right. So it's. I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, what I've been doing in the recent weeks, especially, is I'm, I pulled hundreds and hundreds of tweets from uh, 2019 and 2020 that expressed support for both Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders. So this is sort of what gave me the idea initially to do this research is that I worked in politics in the United States um, and I, I noticed there was this overlap of supporters of Jeremy Corbyn around the 2019 uh, UK general election and Bernie Sanders in the lead up to the 2020. Uh, it definitely uh, U.S. election definitely goes back further than that. And I'm very interested sort of in, in political fandom studies. Professor Dean at University of Leeds has done a lot of work on this. Uh, but I'm, I'm, what I'm interested in especially is how this moves international. So there's been a lot of studies about political fandom as it relates to specific countries, you know, political fandom around people like Donald Trump, uh, people like Jeremy Corbyn in the UK, all sorts of uh, different politicians who have sort of these fan groups surrounding them. But what I'm really looking to add to the literature is studying how sort of international fandom people from outside the specific country can sort of latch on to politicians as well. And what this does to sort of the overall exchange of ideas and exchange of rhetoric between sort of socialist movements in various countries. So what I'm looking through and the tweets, for example, which is just one part of the study, is sort of what are the common themes that sort of over allow people that are into one of them, for example, Bernie Sanders, what are the themes that allow them to sort of connect as well to Jeremy Corbyn uh, and vice versa? So what are the policy areas that seem to come up the most in these tweets that express support for both? What are sort of the values that are perceived to be held by both of those elected officials that really sort of motivate this political fandom, this international political fandom? And so um, that's basically what I'm looking to study, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, just just a quick follow up from me. Have you noticed a difference in the shift uh, in Twitter that we've seen with Elon Musk and the, the 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 rise of the the subscription service and the blue tick, which obviously gives certain people priority? Has that shifted what you've done? Has that affected what you're doing? Uh, yeah, it has. I to be honest with you, I cannot stand Elon Musk. He's made my research a lot more difficult. Uh, so when I started this, Elon Musk had not purchased Twitter. Uh, so I wish that never happened. But yes, it's uh, I again the the one good thing I should say is that a lot of what I'm doing is based sort of a few years ago. So uh, there's been a lot of people have asked me like, oh, have a lot of people that you follow left the platform? And generally, in my experience, a lot of that will say activists or very vocal people on the socialist left have not left Twitter. But in terms of like, for example, searching for tweets, pulling tweets, you have to be a bit more careful because of who gets, whose tweets get promoted um, and whatnot. So, and any, in general, I think most researchers will tell you any sort of major instability in, in what you're researching is never fun. So when Elon Musk took over and started firing a bunch of people at Twitter, I was like, oh boy. But there, there are some advantages to what I'm doing and that again, it's not really looking at it right now so much as it's looking a few years back and um and yeah and generally my experience it hasn't changed that much but certainly like who is promoted whose tweets are promoted that's something i'm having to be careful with because the algorithm and the sort of formula at place has changed and they promote people that pay you know for the blue tick so trying to make sure i get tweets that are not just that you know yeah that's that's the that's the one way i'd say it's really changed due to elon musk so political fandoms, Twitter, kind of looking both at the UK and at the US, these are very specific topics. And I'm just wondering, how did you get to, to narrowing down the potentially broad interest that you've had into such a specific and, and absolutely fascinating topic? Could you give us more insight into that? Yeah, so I think Twitter... I, so the, the, the Twitter is one part. The other part of research I'm doing, I've done interviews with a lot of people who are activists in both the Democratic Socialist of America and Momentum here in the UK. And uh, I, I, in the interviews, I'm asking them a lot of questions about their social media use, as well as, again, the sort of why they are attached to certain political officials, uh, why there's sort of this fandom emerging, how they feel about their uh, comrades, as they would say, across the pond. But why I narrowed it down to specifically study Twitter is that there's just too much, there's too many directions to go in without. I mean, I know I wanted a social media aspect to it because that's where a lot of, I mean, especially when you're looking at international fandoms, you know, it's not going to be a lot of in-person events. It's going to be done sort of in the digital space, right? And so I had to pick one and I was familiar with how much exchange of sort of ideas and how political Twitter can be. And so I just thought that it was the best, it was the best one to use. There's a lot of research out there that's shown that, um, you know, that Twitter is a platform that is not used by actually that many people when compared to other social media platforms, but it's overrepresented in um, the political sphere. And so it just made sense as like, that was the one to study, uh, especially again, I, the thing is with this research is I had, I, 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 know a lot of people that were sort of in these fandoms before I started and Twitter was the platform where they expressed these support perhaps the most um, obviously. So that is sort of why I narrowed it down to Twitter. And just because like you don't have time to do Twitter and Facebook and Reddit and Instagram, I mean, they're all interesting and they all sort of have different mechanisms in place for how ideas are shared. But uh, it, it's too much for one PhD to look at all the different uh social media platforms. So I, I picked Twitter and I think it's been it's been the right choice, even with pesky Elon Musk in the background. Uh, so yeah, that, that's what I would say. Absolutely. And more personally, I mean, I don't know how far you are in your research. So whether that be something you're looking forward to in the future as you get deeper into your research, or maybe something you've kind of encountered already, what, what do you find is most interesting about the research that you're conducting, the work that you're doing? So it's really interesting that I come in with a bit of preconceived notions of what I expected to see, especially in the Twitter analysis portion. So 
And this is just one interesting thing that I found. I think, you know, when you look at these groups, sort of democratic socialist, you would expect sort of the socialist economic ideas to be sort of at the forefront of uh, sort of this exchange of rhetoric between the DSA and momentum. And while that is certainly a major element, what I found, and this is, I guess, in a way, a bit of a spoiler alert on what I found on my Twitter analysis, uh, is that actually it's pretty much neck and neck between that and sort of foreign policy issues as what drives this sort of fandom, what drives a lot of the conversation around the fandom online. And I found that very interesting. I mean, I'm looking at tweets from a few years ago, but it's also worth noting that right now what's gone on with the sort of overlap between socialist, a lot of socialist activists and the pro-Palestine movement, you see that even a few years ago, you see how important sort of a will say socialist foreign policy view was to this sort of community. And that was interesting. I mean, I expected it to be there to a certain extent, but I did not expect it to be quite as prevalent as it was, especially when I compare to like other topics such as environmental issues. It completely dwarfs that in terms of how many tweets you get about sort of foreign policy versus how many tweets you would get about stuff like the Green New Deal and environmental issues. So I found that to be a bit surprising and very interesting given the context of what's going on right now. So yeah, that's one I found very interesting thing about the research. So John, you there are endless amounts of tweets, you know, tens of thousands, I'm sure that that you're looking at working with. What do you do with them? What will you do with them? You know, what are your sort of methods of research here? How does it work? So for the tweets, what I'm doing is I'm doing sort of a uh, qualitative analysis of them. So I pulled hundreds and hundreds of tweets. Well, actually, I probably pulled more than that because I had to sort through. So basically, you go into the Twitter function, you search for tweets mentioning Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders, both within a specific time frame, right? And then from that, you start sorting through the tweets. So any tweet that's critical of both has to be out because obviously I'm just studying the fandom. And then, so you really have to sort through a lot. That took a lot of time. And then the remaining tweets that you have, which are in the hundreds and hundreds, you have to sort of go through and apply sort of qualitative values to them. So again, there's two sets of what I'm looking at. The first question is like, what policy areas are sort of most discussed? So you'll see a tweet and you'll say, okay, this tweet seems to be discussing, um, you know, environmental politics. You know, let's say someone tweets, oh, Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders together as prime minister and president, that's the best way to stop our, die, our dying planet. Well, I would classify that as a tweet sort of about environmental issues. So then you go to the next tweet, what, what sort of issues are being discussed there? So I'm doing a sort of qualitative analysis of the themes of that, of these tweets. And then uh, from there, I'm also doing this second section of it is what sort of themes specifically about Corbyn and Sanders themselves at this particular point in time, what are sort of the attributes that people are tweeting about discussing? So there's sort of, uh, in political science research, there's two ways people sort of analyze candidates. It's through warmth traits or through competence traits. So warmth traits would be stuff like um, kindness, would be stuff like empathy, uh, these sort of traits that uh, relatability would be another one that would be sort of in these sort of warmth traits of why people become attached to a certain uh, politician. Then there's competence traits, and these are uh, stuff relating to like ability to do one's job as an elected official, um, past successes in legislature, consistency of sort of beliefs. And uh, so these, I'm looking at all these tweets and seeing which type of traits are most commonly seen in tweets expressing support for both Corbyn and Sanders. Does it fall more into the warmth trait? Does it fall more into the competence trait? Uh, looking at that kind of question. So basically with the tweets I'm getting, I'm doing analysis of the themes tweet by tweet, if that makes sense. Okay. And as you'll know from spending a lot of time with Twitter, uh, Bernie Sanders is one of the most heavily memed um politicians out there you know him with mittens on him sitting on benches yeah. they'll put him everywhere right 
So do do those sort of meme tweets for, for Corbyn and Sanders, do they factor into what you're doing or do you discount those? Well, it's interesting. I was talking to my supervisor, Alex Clarkson, about this. And memes are definitely a big part of the political discourse just at large, I think, on social media. And it's something when I started this research, I didn't necessarily count for. Uh, the thing is, so I've got sort of the part of re my research, which is focused on the Twitter analysis. I've got the part of the research, which is focused on my sort of in-person interviews with activists. And I'm just still debating how I'm going to incorporate sort of memes into the later stages of it, maybe a third section specifically about political memes that I can't be sure of right now. Uh, but it is certainly something that comes up a lot, especially on Twitter. You see the memes and you don't really know how to classify it because I just explained sort of how I'm classifying these tweets. The meme tweets are not, um, you know, they're not usually expressing support for one type of policy. And I think they can be attached to some of the traits I was discussing, but it's a little bit more complicated than just someone tweeting something like, oh, imagine if we had Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn, two kind principled men in office like that. You can sit there and say, OK, these are sort of traits that they're applying to those candidates, whereas with memes like it's a bit more. Um, I suppose subtle or you have, you have to sort of find other ways to do it. So it's definitely something that's on my radar because it's a a big portion of sort of political discourse at large memes. But again, another issue that you might think of with that, right, is people tweeting the Bernie Sanders sitting on a bench or Bernie Sanders with the, you know, I'm asking you, you know, this one, you know, that kind of thing, right? How many people are tweeting that because they like Bernie Sanders? How many people are tweeting that because they find that that image to be like funny, you know? So it's like, it's hard to sort of with other tweets, you could pretty much clearly tell who's in a fandom and who's not based on what the sort of content of their tweet is. And if they're expressing like support for Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn um, with memes, I feel like an issue I have is that it's a little bit unclear if like, oh, people are just tweeting this because it's they love Bernie Sanders or Jeremy Corbyn or if they're tweeting it because they just find it kind of funny and don't really care either way. So it's like these are kind of the questions that are challenges for incorporating memes into this research. But it is something I'm definitely aware of. It's hard not to notice it. So I gather that you, you, you've done the big part. You've, you've sorted through all of these tweets that are out there, you know, millions and millions. Um, and I can't even imagine how long that took you. And also from the spoiler you gave us, I assume that you're quite at least pretty far along in your research. Um, yeah. But could you give us more of a timeline of how far you are, um, and how long do you think it'll take you before you can say that you've you've got a finished product? I, so it's interesting. I and this might I don't know if this is part of what you might ask in the second portion of this, but I kind of did this research in a weird way in the sense that usually people are like, okay, I'm going to do the literature review. I'm going to do the methodology chapter. Then I'm going to go collect the research. But what happened was I was sort of starting out as a, PhD student here at King's, and there was an event that Bernie Sanders was coming to London to speak uh, to the RMT union, and I went to that event and found lots of people that were willing to be interviewed uh, as part of my interview section, and so I couldn't really tell them, oh, I'll come back and talk to you like in the six months to a year's time, so I did a lot of the initial interviews before I had really even finished like the literature and methodology section. But the thing is, it's it's, it's very unusual uh, in my experience for someone to do it like that. But I can't, when opportunities present itself like that, which like it's a textbook definition of like how sort of the US and UK left can sort of like merge. Uh, I couldn't pass up an opportunity like that. So that's the first thing I'll say is that I did sort of a weird time timeline of how I conducted the research. But again, sometimes you have to take what what, what you're given. And uh, so I'm happy with that. But in terms of when it'll be finished, I, I target um, December 2024, January 2025, sometime in that time frame. And how do you think kind of taking this more unconventional approach and, and conducting the interviews before you might have gotten a chance to finish your literature review methodology. How do you think that's, that will impact kind of the final product or has impact in your writing process now? Like, do you find it harder to kind of go back now and do a literature review and the methodology or is it just a different process? 
No, I don't think it's harder. I think what I'd say is it actually reaffirmed what I was thinking from the start because I was asking people, one of the big questions I asked in the interviews is like, hey, what social media platforms do you use? How often do you use them? And these interviews I conducted very early on in my research from people that I mostly met at these at this sort of Bernie Sanders RMT union event is that uh, everybody used Twitter. Basically, everybody used Twitter. That was the one they used the most, right? And so I was like, oh, okay. So this kind of reaffirms what I was already planning to do, uh, which was looking at Twitter as opposed to other social media platforms. Um, so in a way, it was sort of helpful. At, I don't want to say it, I use it as justification, but I could sit there and say, yes, you know, like there's all sorts of platforms that people use for political discourse, but uh, the interviews I've conducted to this point have shown me that Twitter is still uh, a very active one. So in a way, it was helpful to justify to my supervisors like why I was focusing on Twitter. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's sort of the big thing. I don't think it really impacts sort of my conclusions from the research that much, but it, it, it uh, gave me sort of um, gave me things to consider and also reaffirm sort of the methodology that I had already started sort of thinking about in my head. Um, so yeah, that, but it, it was a very interesting, uh, kind of a strange way. I remember sending my supervisor, like the summary is of my emails is one of my first sort of written, uh, submissions, I guess you could say to my supervisor. And he's like, Oh, you've done this differently than most people. I'm like, well, yes, my parents did say I was a special child. So, you know, never taking the easy way out, I suppose, but, uh, it's all been good. I can't complain. Uh, and really, I think, and this is something that you might get into later, but as a first year sort of PhD student, getting out and doing a lot of research, I mean, my, and to be clear, my interviews I conducted eventually via phone, uh, but like going out to these events and meeting people, uh, which I would did interview later over the phone, I felt like was kind of helpful to sort of go ahead and get my foot in the door of the community and stuff. So getting that done quickly, I, I thought was good, you know. So when you were sitting down to think about what you were going to do your PhD around, did you have an idea in mind that you were going to do US and UK politics? Did you start thinking, do you know what, I want to look at Bernie Sanders? And then as you developed, you thought, okay, I've noticed similarities, similarities with, with Jeremy Corbyn. How did that process arrive at, at where you've ended up? No, the international, the sort of both focus is has been just, has been sort of that's sort of what motivated me to do this topic at, at the beginning is because there's a lot of research on momentum. There's a lot of research on the Democratic Socialist of America and Bernie Sanders and what would become like AOC as well. To me, though, I wanted to study how they sort of – I, I noticed this. I noticed this trend like because I was on sort of a lot of political social media as part of my job back in – uh, back in the day, and I noticed that there were a lot of like British people who were very passionate about Bernie Sanders, and that I saw, I started noticing sort of this overlap, and I thought that was really, really interesting. So I, I, I approached it knowing I was going to study both because that was sort of kind of the idea, kind of what motivated me to do this. And uh, yeah, so I know I, I, I've been doing, uh, I've been focused on uh, studying both the U.S. and the U.K in this research since the, since I started this topic, so. And has anything that you've found so far or noticed so far surprised you, or is, it, or is there a finding or a, a trend that stood out for you? Well, I think that what I mentioned earlier about the prevalence of foreign policy in the tweets that I've pulled, especially when compared to others. So to be clear, it's not the top, uh, it, it's slightly, I forget the exact number, but it's slightly, uh, again, sort of economic issues are slightly more in, uh, common in the tweets that I found, but foreign policy matters, foreign policy issues um, are, it's pretty much neck and neck. And I did not expect it to be quite as prevalent as I did end up finding it. So especially when compared to like, I thought environmental politics, especially because I went to a lot of sort of socialist environmental rallies to meet people as well to be interviewed, I thought this would be a higher or more common, commonly expressed issue in the tweets that I studied, but really foreign policy dwarfs that one. So I'm just a little bit surprised at the degree to which foreign policy has been 
a driving force in the conversation around sort of this online fandom around Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn. So I'd say that's sort of the more big surprise, I guess you could say. On that note, that concludes part one of the podcast. We will take a brief break and come back to you with part two. Hello, everyone. Now we're just going to be kicking off into a 15-minute segment of rapid-fire questions from you, the listener. So, John, in a poll submitted to the DP or the, the SP Instagram, 57% of students answered that they would be willing to do a PhD in the future. And these are some questions that they had um, in light of that kind of majoritarian um, positive perception of, of undergoing a PhD. So the first one, some, some people or some students were, were worried about what it's like to move to a new city. I mean, I don't know where you studied your undergrad or your master's, um, but what it's like to kind of move to a new city, but not even that, but kind of be introduced to a new com- community and making new friends, meeting new people and making these new connections. How, how have you found that? It's interesting. So I did my master's at King's, right? Uh-huh. So I, yeah, I did my master's at King's, so it wasn't my first time living in London or living abroad. Um, I think it can be difficult at times. Um, so like, especially if you come from like a master's background or an undergraduate background where you're in class all the time. Like when I was a master's student, I met lots of friends in my classwork and stuff. And some of them still live in London, so that's like a positive for me. Um, but I would say it, it 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 is a bit of a challenge. Like you got to get used to, and some people don't. This doesn't bother them at all. But like I do think at in general, like a PhD, you have to a little bit get used to being on your own a bit more. Um, I'll be honest, and this might preempt some of the questions from the second part. I haven't really done that many of the PhD sort of doctoral student events. Um, I, I don't know why. I think sometimes timing's a bit strange and I don't know. I just, I, I also do a lot of research like at home. So like before I moved to a, to like a King's accommodation building, I, you know, I was living in like far South London and it was just sort of like, I don't, I don't know, do I want to go all the way in just for like one event and stuff? So like, I do think like, I would say that I, I love London and we can talk about this more, but I think you know, if you're before you do a PhD, you need to be willing to say that it, it's going to be, you know, especially compared to master's programs, a little bit lonelier, I feel like. So, you know, that's not for everybody and it, it can be a challenge. But, you know, if you're really passionate about PhD work, I don't think it should deter you, you know. And what would you say have been kind of your main your main ways of kind of battling this loneliness or this shift that you've seen from a master's to a PhD? Have you come up with any kind of solutions or maybe ways to kind of get around it so i love teaching and this is something that king's does is like working you know gta work and stuff um i think teaching is great because it pulls you out of just doing research you get to interact with students like this year i'm teaching uh, intro to comparative politics well i think that's the title of it it's basically an intro to comparative politics and uh so i'm doing with a lot of first year students and i think uh it's great. I love it. Uh, I, I'm someone that gets energy from other people. Uh, so I, that's another reason why I maybe sort of did a lot of the interviews first in my research is again, to get more of that sort of interaction. I find that to be very helpful. Yeah. And King's has a lot of societies as well that are open to postgrad and undergraduate students. And I find those societies to be a fun way to go. Um, I guess maybe one of the reasons why I didn't go to so many of the PhD doctoral student events is that I, uh, I just wanted something a little bit more different. You know, like I do, I do doctoral work like all day basically. So it's like going somewhere with, with other doctoral students, you know, I feel like sometimes I want to get sort of a broader, uh, a broader sort of group. So I, I think those would be what I would say. I would say join societies. Um, I would say if you can, as soon as you can to teach, because I mean, quite frankly, that's one of my motivations for doing the PhD is because I want to become a full-time sort of professor and I love lecturing. I love leading seminars and stuff like that. It, it brings me a lot of joy. So um, that's really helpful. And uh, yeah, that, that's sort of what I would say to that. 
Great. And then I guess a second question, which I think we're going to get into some more in, in the second sec session, section, but if you could just kind of give a brief overview of how you've been managing the workload, because I know for a lot of students, the decision to undertake a PhD is very daunting, given just the sheer amount of work that is, that is required of you. And maybe can you calm some anxieties or ease some anxieties about the workload that comes with the PhD or not? Like maybe these fears are, are very much warranted. I don't personally, I mean, the workload, it, I mean, if you're coming at it from like a, you've just been working like in like a professional job or something, I don't think the workload is going to be like more than that or anything. I mean, I, I, I mean, the workload, it's not, I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's easy or anything, but I, I don't think it's like, in my experience, it's not like overwhelming the workload. Like I work, I would say as much as anybody else would work in any other sort of um, job. I, what I do, I think time management can be a problem uh, um and so uh when you don't have like again go, as, as opposed to like a more professional job or like even as like a master's student or something when you have like um you know, oh you have to be at class on this day and this day and this day phd students you have a lot more sort of flexibility and so i think that can be a challenge in like managing the workload um so like one thing I do is I tend to do work on like the weekends a, a decent amount. So like Sundays I'll go into campus uh, because uh, it's quiet and I know I can do a lot of research and work there. Uh, but then other, I might, you know, some random Tuesday, I might not do anything. So it's like making yourself sort of comfortable with how you do research and how you sort of, when you're at your best sort of brain productivity I think is very helpful sort of in managing the workload. Um, but I will just say to ally any fears that I personally don't think like the workload is, is like that much more than it would be if you were just like doing any sort of other professional job, if that makes sense. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's like easy, but I'm just saying it's, it's not like, a, I wouldn't say it's like, a, I, I know people sometimes freak out about the workload and I would just say it, it, it it's, it's a normal amount of workload in, in my experience. Another question was regarding funding and funding and grants and kind of the ability to kind of get financial support for a PhD because some students were kind of concerned as, with that and kind of that being a hurdle and a limitation to, to them being able to pursue a PhD. From what you know, or maybe your own personal experience, how accessible is it for, for students to, to kind of acquire um, some form of funding for their PhD? Is it easier, harder, the same as for an undergrad or, or a master's? Okay, well, that, that second part is a little bit difficult. I, what I would say is, from a PhD perspective, there's a decent amount of funding to be going around. Um, I'm actually self-funded, so I don't know if I'm the right person to ask about this, but I know lots of people who are not entirely self-funded. So, uh, and that could also change your experience and level sort of, of uh, I guess you could say stress and workload as well, depending on the nature of your funding. Yeah, to be honest, I I don't think I'm really the right person to be asking about that question. Um, but I do know that I get the emails frequently about from sort of different sort of comp competitions. I'm like the a wrong word, but like sort of calls for funding fairly frequently. Uh, I think when you apply, there's sort of two ways you go about doing it. When you start, you can start out self-funded and then there's opportunities that may arise as you go into it uh, for funding, specifically depending on what your research is on. And again, what department your research is in, I think oh, that kind of matters. But then there's also people that start with sort of a self-funding, or excuse me, that start with sort of having a having gotten funding from the start. I, in terms of what percentage it is, I, I can't really answer that question. The one thing I will say is like teaching, get you money it's like teaching what can help cover like rent and things of that nature right um that's one of the things i use a lot i taught i basically taught almost every semester that i've been at king's as a phd student i taught first semester i taught um actually remotely with my a previous employer in the u.s but then i've taught now for uh it will be for three semesters at king's as well and so that's get some income in that can help cover things like rent uh, expenses of that nature. So yeah, I mean, again, I'm not the best person to answer this question, but I do know there is a lot of funding out there. It is competitive, but there is a lot of sort of different funding 
calls for research in general that people can can look at. Amazing. And so you've talked about kind of the the, the time, um, the, the kind of time and the effort that you're putting into this, um, maybe even, you know, some, some funds that you're kind of dedicating to your PhD. And we've had some students ask, well, is it worth it? And I think that's a very kind of subjective thing. And what you say is not applicable for everyone because, you know, we all have our own preconceived notions and our own goals that maybe we wish to get out of a PhD. But for you, as far along as you've gone and from the passionate way you're talking about your research, I have a feeling that I know what you're going to say, but it, do you find that it's, it's worth it? And would you do it all over again if you could pick from, from the beginning? Yeah, I would. I mean, for me, so what I would say is like, when anybody says that they want to do a PhD, it's like, what is your goal? That's kind of what I would ask, first of all. Like, I want to work in academia because I love, I mean, I, I like doing research. I like what I research, but I love to teach. And so in order to sort of take, take the next step and sort of make that as my career, I need to sort of have a PhD, right? So uh, in that sense, like, yes, it's worth it. Other people that want to get the PhD and then go into sort of work outside of academia, I don't know. I, I, I don't know because that's not really the path I'm taking. I can't say if like that's if that's worth the investment at this point in time. But I approach it like, okay, I'm doing this for a specific reason, and that is to get jobs in universities after I get my PhD. And so for me, it's like, yeah, it, it, it's worth it. <laughs> and that's sort of how I'd answer that question. It's like I would tell, and I've had people ask me, you know, people in the building and stuff like, hey, is it worth doing a PhD? I'd say, well, it depends on what you're looking to get out of it. You know, you're going to get, you're going to become an expert in, in whatever sort of area you're going to study. That's good. Uh, in terms of employment in the future, it, it again, it depends on what sort of path you're looking to take. Absolutely. And for someone like me, who's, who's kind of main benefit from potentially taking a PhD is currently standing at the title of a doctor, which I mean, has its own benefits. It does have a nice ring to it. I, I do see it as being a very personal decision and kind of, you know, the way that you're, you're approaching it to be a very kind of personal um, benefit cost analysis. And the last well, question, I, I'm sorry, no, go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was going to make the very tired joke. It's like, you know, you're on a plane and someone says, excuse me, excuse me, is there a doctor on the plane? And I can say like, um, only in studying socialist left-wing actors. I'm not sure if that's going to be too helpful on the flight, but uh, yes. Yeah, so I guess sometimes having that expertise can uh, lead to some fun conversation. So uh, I mean, listen, like, I also think like what I would just say in general is that um, make sure whatever you do as your PhD topic, you really like the topic because otherwise you're going to hate yourself. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know how else to put it. Like it's not, because you're going to go into the weeds of all this literature review. You're going to spend all this time looking at sort of, you know, different permutations, different sort of ways you could go with the re like. If, so if you, I can't imagine doing a PhD and like not liking your research topic. Like so, the, you know, that's kind of what I would say about that. You know. So, but anyway, I digress. Absolutely no. I think that's that's really good advice, and I think maybe some students are going to benefit from that. Especially, I mean, for a lot of us in the undergraduate program, in their third years might be doing an undergraduate dissertation, which doesn't even compare to the PhD one. But um, definitely kind of selecting your topic has been on, on our minds. Um, and lastly, more so related to your actual academic kind of topic, 57% of, of students that answered the poll said they know a lot about the influence of Twitter on politics. Um, I would like to get your take on what the common misconceptions about the role of Twitter in politics are. And whether or not you really do think that that 57% of students do really know how Twitter is, is, that, is what role Twitter has in politics these days. Well, you're asking me to sort of evaluate uh, <laughs> how much faith I put in undergraduate students' knowledge of politics. So I, I, I don't want to go down that, um, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole right now. But what I will say is, I think that I think what I said earlier, actually, about the fact that I think Twitter, especially in the news now, because of all the stuff that Elon Musk has done, Twitter has this perception as being massive platform, which it is to a certain extent. But we have cold, hard numbers that show us that the percentage of the general population that use Twitter is pretty low, especially when you compare it to Facebook or Instagram, right? 
And so it's like, I think what people need to understand, I, I guess, and maybe again, this is where I don't know what, what these students think or what they don't think. But I mean, what I would say is one misconception at large is that people think that sort of Twitter conversations represent sort of what you see on Twitter represents political discourse at large. And it's just not, it's just not true at all. Like you get the most, I don't want to say extreme, but you get definitely the extremes on Twitter a lot more. Like there's not that many people that go onto Twitter and, you know, just say like, oh, like my goal on Twitter is to express support for like the middle ground on policies. Like you're not going to get that much attention on Twitter doing that. <laughs> so I would say that, that, you know, it, it, it's not a microcosm of how actual sort of the actual political sphere at large. It's specific to journalists that are on Twitter and people that would identify themselves as like activists. And typically in my experience on either the, the, the sort of, I don't like to say far left, but the socialist left or sort of the sort of uh, populist right, I think those are two of the most common groups you see on Twitter. And so I think if you just are on Twitter, you can go a little bit nuts because like these are the only type of people that you see posting political content. <laughs> so for me, like I have to sometimes, even because I'm on Twitter so much, like I have to sort of be like, okay, let's let's leave it for a few days, not go on Twitter for a few days and see what like people are saying like elsewhere because sometimes it can be a little bit of a mind warp um, just because again, it, it tends to elevate and promote voices on sort of I don't want to say the fringes, but on this, the extremes of both sort of sides. And it's certainly not representative of what I think the average voter in any country feels. Uh, so I, I don't know if that's a misconception. I feel like people understand that, some people, but that's one thing that could be a misconception, I guess, about Twitter. Well, thank you very much. And that concludes our yeah. short 15 minute segment. I hope some of the questions that the students had have been answered. I certainly think so. And hopefully this leads to, to a sudden increase in the number of students willing to take a PhD. And we strive next week or in the next podcast for 100%. Thank you. And welcome back, everybody, for the second part of our podcast. In the first half, we spoke to John about his research and, and specifically the topics he's looking at. And in this second half, we're going to speak to him about his personal experience of the PhD process. And for the first question, I am handing over to Clara. Thank you very much. And for the first question, I'm wondering, so you've mentioned how maybe the final Findings have been different than your expectations. Maybe you weren't expecting to kind of begin with interviews before you go into the literature review or the methodology. But what else about undergoing the PhD process has kind of surprised you or kind of exceeded or, or, or fallen short of your expectations? Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't have like necessarily a set answer to that. What I would say is I think that as a PhD student, like going into the research, like, you know, the literature review is very interesting to me because um, what people choose to study as part of literature is view is very interesting. Uh, one thing that I actually, um, I'll tell you a surprise. I don't know if this is too specific for what you're looking for, but I was talking with my second supervisor, uh, Alex Clarkson, uh, the other day, and he drew my attention to something like uh, the fact that, so what I'm studying a lot of in 2019, 2020, this sort of exchange of ideas this sort of overlapping international political fandom between sort of the DSA in the US and Bernie Sanders, as well as Jeremy Corbyn and Momentum in the UK, is that a lot of people that were sort of into this group, especially, you know, around 2016, around these type of, of uh, elections, there's a significant, not, not significant, but there's a decent section of them who have actually turned out to be fairly right wing as the, the discourse has gone on. And some of the figures that sort of pop up that you see get influence within this community at this particular time are kind of interesting. I didn't necessarily expect it to go down this path. Um, like, for example, and this is interesting given recent news events, but like Russell Brand was like fairly active amongst people that was like in this fan group, uh, in this sort of fandom. And that's obviously gone down sort of a different path in recent 
in recent months, but like you have figures that sort of exist on the fringes that aren't elected officials that contribute to these fandoms, that contribute to sort of the exchange of ideas. And I'm a little surprised at the 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 degree to which some of them have sort of broke and become fairly right-wing actors. And I think it speaks to a, a core theme that I'm noticing in my research, which is that opposition to sort of the perceived establishment or the perceived center is sometimes like what motivates a lot of this fandom. So like there's people that, again, I don't think this is indicative of the entire fandom, but it's interesting to see sort of how it splinters and how some people sort of view sort of the populist right as being more of an ally to their movement than like more establishment center left politicians. And so what that does to sort of how people progress over time is kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if that's too specific of an answer to what you're looking for, but um, that sort of whole subtext of sort of the dirtbag left is one sort of expression for this, how they sort of gone you know, kind of this anti-woke, anti-cancel culture, how that sort of very online, but a very weird way in which this sort of fandom has kind of devolved since 2020. And again, I'm not saying that's the majority of people at all, but it's an interesting sort of splinter group. Uh, So that's that's kind of a surprising uh, thing, I suppose. I was not as aware of that sort of subset of the fandom before I started this research. Um, That was probably too specific to (laughs) to what you're asking but um i think it's interesting and so i just wanted to throw that out there but no that's fascinating and i guess i'm wondering yeah. how do these subsets of either questions or findings that defy your expectations have to then be factored into your research like do you find that when these things come up you have to shift maybe your your approach your methodology um potentially you know rethink how you might want to phrase certain things or readapt your research or do you think that usually they can be absorbed in your in your framework quite naturally so i think what it is is that it's understanding that there's a lot of fluidity in what you research i think the issue i had when i started this research was that i came into it thinking okay there's there's a socialist left and like that's that i'm studying the socialist left and i'm studying you know dsa i'm studying momentum i'm studying these groups i'm studying supporters of sanders supporters of corbyn but it's not a monolith and it evolves and devolves over time. And so um, I think when I, and this is something I discussed when I did my upgrade, my mini Viva is that I needed to, in my literature, not my literature review, but sort of in my initial chapters, I need to acknowledge the fact that this group splinters and that, you know, this group, it's not a sort of a monolithic thing to study. And it's never going to be the focus of my research to sort of, like talk about the dirtbag left or anything like that but acknowledging the existence of this is important to sort of contextualizing the rest of your research so i don't think it really messes with my methodology or anything like that um but it is something that you need to note so that you make sure you cover yourself basically and say like listen i'm i'm studying this group uh, but it's important to note that there's subsets of this group and that i can't you know that all these tweets obviously do not speak for everybody that's in in this group and that there's different sort of, again, avenues or paths that um, people take. Because basically, like, especially in the UK, it's really interesting because after the, I mean, I think it's fair to say the absolute electoral disaster that happened with uh, momentum in 2019, obviously labor has gone in a completely different direction. And so what's happened to that fandom around Jeremy Corbyn as the years have gone on from 2019 and 2020 uh, it's it's kind of splintered. It's kind of it, it's gone in some interesting directions. And so it's not my job to track all of these directions, but noting the fact that this is not just like one monolith group that stays the same all the time is critical to making sure that I com- that my research is you know uh, well rounded, basically. John, as we've spoken to people for this podcast, we've asked them sort of what has helped them during the process. Some people have said uh, running. They have their best ideas when they're running. Some people have said listening to jazz. Um, some people have taught themselves Python um, coding to to help themselves. Is there anything in particular that has helped you during the process? Have, have you taught yourself Python, for example? So I, I haven't completely done that. I've, I've done a little bit of sort of 
teaching myself coding because initially I thought when I was getting the Twitter data that I would have to sort of get it in sort of code form. But I figured for what I'm doing for qualitative tweets, I don't need to go quite that quite that hardcore. Uh, in terms of what's helped, best ideas. See, I, I don't have my best ideas when running. Um, <laughs> I uh, don't know. I, I, I tend to, I think, well, first of all, open communication with your supervisors. That's probably a boring answer, but like these people know what they're talking about. And so talking with them, talking things out, speaking. So one issue I think a lot of students have is it makes sense in your head. But when you write, when you write it down, sometimes like you connect the dots as, as a researcher, you connect the dots in your own head. But in the written work that you do, you're, you're, you know, if you read it from a neutral eye, you don't quite connect all the dots. And so having open communication with your supervisor, I think, is very helpful for that. I think um, having passions outside of research um, is very, very important. Being able to sort of reset your mind. And London's great for this because there's so much to, 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 to do in London. Um, I think getting out and about is, is very important. You, do, you never want to be in a situation where you're really just like stuck in your room doing research because it can just sort of eat at your mind in a way because like you're just doing the same topic over and over again and so, I mean, that's the only thing I would say is that, you know, I've done a lot of like, I took some Kings offered some courses, not courses, but specific sort of lessons and like interview techniques, things of this nature, which were helpful. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I don't have like a magic answer to that. Um, but yeah, I'd say having a well-rounded life is important and uh, you never know when the best ideas can come to you uh, in terms of like how to fray. Like sometimes I'll be struggling with like, if I'm doing a write up, like I just can't get the right, I'm really obsessed with like the writing itself. Like I can't, this doesn't feel right. Like what I've just written down doesn't feel like the right way to explain this. I, I'll like struggle a lot in like how to like form the right sentences for this. And sometimes I'll just, something will just click and it'll be randomly like, like cooking dinner in the shower, whatever the case is. So yeah, I, I do, understand that but in terms of at large i would say open communication with your supervisor and having a well-balanced life are the two most helpful things for any phd project and so on the flip side of that question uh, i'm i'm going to ask you what are the challenges what have been the biggest hurdles that you faced while undergoing the phd writing process since the beginning to now and maybe what you foresee to be big hurdles in in the future between now and your your completion Right. So I think the biggest hurdle in terms of the actual research is you can probably tell by the nature of this podcast that I'm a bit scatterbrained, not the right word. I'm a bit, I can go in sort of different directions very uh, easily. And so I think most PhD students, I would assume, are very curious people by nature. And so as I was doing like the literature review for this, or as I was looking through all these tweets, there's all these things that sort of come up and like, oh, that's interesting. I want to look into that. Like, again, I mentioned the dirtbag left stuff a few minutes ago. That's just one example, right? This sort of splinter group. I also come across when doing the Twitter research how other countries involved in this fandom. So places like New Zealand, places like um, France, Brazil, because in the last Brazilian election, there was – a lot of the people that were very into Sanders and Corbyn were also very into Lula and stuff like that. And so I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I should look into that. But the challenge is like focus, like bring it back to center, sort of bring it back to your specific goal. Because otherwise, I mean, it's all very fascinating to me. I'm not a huge nerd for all this stuff. So one of the challenges I had, especially initially, was like chasing down all these leads. In a way, it's a bit like putting a kid into a candy shop. And you give the kid like $5 and you say, hey, Go buy yourself, uh, go pick up, you know, a box of uh, this type of candy. But the kid gets let into the candy shop, and it's like, oh my God, look at this candy, look at that candy, look at that candy, and it's like, focus. You got to focus. Um, and that's a bit of a challenge for me because I'm naturally just like very curious, and so I, I really want to like chase down all these kind of leads and stuff. So I would say, in terms of the research, that's the biggest challenge for sure is making sure you stay focused and. Because you'll be presented with lots of sort of tangentially relevant and very interesting avenues to explore, but you can't really get too far down. And one of the things my supervisors have been very helpful in is like focusing. 
say, okay, this is interesting. Do you really need it in this research though? Let's reframe it this way, that way. Make sure you stay focused on your sort of stated goals. So that's the biggest challenge for me. And then also, again, the loneliness thing at large, I think um, can be a challenge for PhD students because you've got to be in the right headspace, I think, to work well. And if you're struggling with um, loneliness, things of this nature, uh, it can be hard to sort of, I think, work at your best. So yeah, that's how I would answer these questions. Uh, those have been the two sort of main challenges for me. What advice would you give to yourself to day one of PhD, you, uh, knowing what you know now and, and learning what you have learned? Is there anything that you would tell yourself on day one that, that would be valuable, do you think? Yeah, basically what I just said. And <laughs> uh, that stay focused, don't chase everything that you think think is interesting uh yeah i would be you know take action to prepare for um loneliness because you're not going to make friends as easily as you're going to make friends when you're like in a master's program or as an undergraduate student so be prepared for sort of changes to lifestyle set understand yourself well like when do you work your best people there's morning people there's nighttime people what environment do you work best in Personally, I, I do work um, in my in my room, in my at home, basically. But I also think I at an even higher level of function when I go somewhere where there's other people studying. Um, so understanding yourself and like when you're at your sort of maximum productivity, I think is really helpful because you want to then basically build your life around that. So like I am pretty productive at night. Um, unfortunately, I would say, I don't think it's a good trait to have. So it's like when it came time to teaching, it's like, ooh, maybe don't teach the classes that start early in the morning. You know what I mean? So like building your life around sort of when you're at your maximum productivity for doing research, for doing writing, I think is very important. So understanding yourself, understanding your motivations, understanding, again, when you're at your best, how you, at what, you know, at what point you research the best. I think that's very, very important. And it took me a while to figure that out, I think. Um, so if I had been able to tell myself that at the start, it would have been helpful for sure. But you figure it out eventually, I think, either way. So Loneliness has been a theme that has come up uh, in several of these interviews that we've done for, for the yeah. podcast. Is that something you would say you weren't prepared for and, and that people perhaps should consider and prepare for before they apply? 100%. I am someone that gets my energy from being around other people. Other people are not like that. So it, it depends on how you are. Again, it's about knowing yourself. But for me, it was really tough, um, really tough. And I, I, you know, Kings has, I think Kings has a lot of services to help on the sort of mental health side of things, um, which I think is very important for PhD students. For any student, I should say, but for PhD students, yeah. And it, it is a challenge. It was a challenge for me, you know. I recommend, if you can, living in King's accommodations because um, I lived for the first few semesters in, um, you know, private. I, I didn't go down the accommodation route. And I found that to be, because I was, you know, I was concerned, like, oh, you know, I'm, at the time I started the PhD, I was what, 25. I'm like, do I really want to be in accommodation with like 18 year olds? Like, no offense to undergraduates, Clara. Uh, but I was like, is this really, is this really what I want to do? Uh, but actually, I found that yes, it is, especially if you can get one of a lot of postgraduate students in it. Um, I think that's helpful um, because it, loneliness is a challenge because by nature, like what you do is lonely. Like, as a master's student, you have to go to class. You know, as an undergraduate student, you have to go to class. As a PhD student, you, you don't. You, you just do research. So it's like you have to sort of go out, and if you need to make friends, like you have to – the onus is more on you. And so doing things like that, joining societies, I think are helpful. But, yeah, loneliness is something you have to prepare for. Uh, and for some people, that's no problem. I guess it depends on your background, what where you come from in terms of like what you were doing before your PhD. For me – it was a bit of a challenge because I had been doing like political campaign work. I had been doing, uh, I'd been teaching as well to a certain extent at universities in the U S. Um, so I was used to a lot of interaction. And so to go from that to like new country, 
new city and I'm basically doing research all day by myself. Big, big challenge. Um, big, and again, some people it's not a challenge, but if you're someone that really gets a lot of energy from interactions, like that's going to be a challenge for you. So, um, I guess that segues us into, into our last question quite well. So if you've, you've kind of brought in the, the King's PhD community quite a lot, you know, talking about the different opportunities they have, their mental health services and so on. If you could kind of sum up what it's like to be part of the PhD community, maybe how the PhD community gets involved in your research process. Um, I, for one, am curious whether there's kind of a lot of back and forth with your fellow PhD students in terms of giving each other advice, maybe feedback, ask each other to revise what you've already written. Is that something that's that's a big part of the PhD community at King's? I'm not really in that much of the PhD community, to be honest with you. Again, uh, maybe this is a mistake I made, and I should have gone back and been more active in the PhD community. But after doing research all day, the last thing I really wanted to do was to go to some of these. Like they they offer these events on like research workshops and stuff, and like I I, I don't know. I just, it was it just did not motivate me that much to do it. I um, I've met some PhD students since I started teaching a lot more because there's other sort of GTAs that are in a similar situation, and that's been good. But I actually have not really been like bouncing ideas off of another PhD student or anything like that. That's just sort of my experience. So um, again, maybe not the best one to talk to about this. A lot of my friends group in London I knew from my master's program, and I've met more friends since living in accommodation who are master students and stuff so i really don't have like that close of a bond with the phd community uh i met a few at society events and stuff like that but yeah <laughs> i'm sorry that's probably not the answer you were looking for but that's the answer that i have so uh yeah well, I think it's important to get both sides of it. And I think that maybe a lot of people going through a PhD are kind of in a similar boat. Like I can so totally see where it's coming from, that you're already surrounded by all this postgraduate work that it, it seems like, you know, quite maybe there is such a thing as too much postgraduate work. Um, <clears throat> you do mention societies, though. Are you part of any King societies? And if so, which? I am part of some King societies. So I'm how do I explain this? I am someone that really likes to take advantage of being in London as a King student. And so like, and the, the, the huge amount of diversity of people that are at King's and in London in general, I really like to meet people from other places to, I mean, I, I'm a, again, a very curious person. So talking politics with people from other places, just sort of talking about upbringings in different places. I join a lot of these societies that are based sort of around, I guess you could say nationalities. And even though I'm not part of the nationalities, like I'm into French society. I go to a lot of French society events. I'm not French at all. Like, je parle un peu français, but like, I don't, I'm, I'm not very good at French. I'm not French at all, but I like going to these societies and learning more about other people's sort of culture more. Not only that, but like how people are finding London because everybody sort of brings their own home, I think, to London to an extent. And so like, it's a really, I really like to put myself in the middle of a lot of these cultural melding pots. I've been in other societies like that. Um, I was, I've done like sort of King's Irish society a bit, um, especially around like the rugby competitions. I found that to be fun. But yeah, so I've, I've, I've done a lot of, those are society events I kind of like because it's sort of, once a week you go to a pub or something and you talk with people um, and you have people in those societies that are in all sorts of different academic fields. So I just find it interesting. And again, I'm someone that really enjoys sort of these cultural comparisons, cultural conversations, like just asking somebody, Hey, you know, like in the U S we're taught X, Y, and Z about, you know, French history, for example, how are you taught about that same history? Like this might show me like why I'm the way I am because <laughs> these are the type of conversations I enjoy having. And this is why I like those type of societies. So those are the societies I'm involved in. But you're really anything you, you want, you can find at Kings in terms of societies. I know people that are in sports societies and uh, yeah, you know, whatever politics societies, um, it's all good. 
Brilliant. Um, and that brings an end to today's episode. I would like to thank my co-host for today, Clara, for her support. And I would also like to thank John for sharing his thoughts and insights for this episode. Of course, thanks also to you, our listeners, for taking the time to tune in. And we look forward to welcoming you again soon for our next episode. Take care. Thank you.